and there's nothing there. My last breath at 60 feet was an exhale. You would have had to have been on a, on, the, on a moon not to have heard your voice or something that you were in. Uh, you had talked about that. Actually, you know what? It was on, uh, it was on NPR. You'd done an NPR interview like yeah. way back in the day. And uh, it, it, interesting for me to reference NPR, uh, but you did this interview and I, I forget exactly who it was, but I thought that was fascinating that this was a piece of your history based on what you were doing in uh, dirty jobs, you know, really highlighting America's labor industry or their labor professions. But you came from such a, what, what is perceived differently is such a, a, a different background. Yeah. How Well, it's, you know, most people's stories, at least the interesting ones, mm -hmm. aren't predictable. I mean, and it's weird, right? Because th there are a lot of books on the shelves by people who are dying to tell you how they did it. And it almost always starts with, from the earliest age, I... I knew I was destined to blank, 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 you know, right. or I always dreamed of becoming blank, blank, blank. And, um, and, you know, it's very tempting to look back and tell the world exactly how you pulled it off. Um, but for me, it was, it was pretty much the opposite of that. You know, I, I learned very early on that just because you love something doesn't mean you can't suck at it. And, and just because, you, you don't enjoy something doesn't necessarily mean you might not be really good at it. And so for me, I don't remember what I said on that NPR interview, but I did a lot of interviews back in the day and people were constantly and consistently surprised by the fact that my path wasn't straight. And I, I was always surprised by their surprise because I don't know anybody in real life, very few people anyway, who wound up precisely where they thought they were going to be once they started to take themselves seriously. That's true. I think as you're out in the wild, just living life, most interesting people have had a really diverse path where they've had kind of this eclectic group of experiences that have ultimately created their own story. I think that's, uh, that's fairly obvious. I, I'm really interested to hear that story, though, from your perspective, it, just to start in the context of how did you? What, what, and you've and I've, you've answered this question a few times, but I have to hear it again for. And I think my audience will love to hear it, which is when you decided to take on that professional track or track. Was it from an early age? Did you love <laughs> singing? Was it something that you were drawn to, oh, or God, no. was it? <clears throat> was it really just, I mean, who, who gave you this directive or was it, how did you find your way in that? Because it, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that this was something where you started. Well, I'll give you the super short version. I mean, right. honestly, the, like the true version is a 400 page memoir. I can't get around to finishing, but, but the super <laughs> short strokes, like you have to start with the misperceptions that I think surround me. You know, there are a lot of people who dirty jobs has been on the air every single week for 20 years, thousands of times a year, right? Uh, Deadliest Catch is now in its 18th yeah. season. So the just the cumulative effect of, of working on shows like that has left a lot of people with a very specific impression of, of who I am. And they figure that, well, I'm a stunt chunky for mm -hmm. starters, because there's lots of images and footage of me hanging upside down from a bosun's right. chair welding a bridge uh, 400 feet in the air. And so people just assume that I, that's the kind of thing I do every day. And that's kind of what I'm all about. They, they think I can fix anything. They think I can repair anything. They think I'm a lot of different things. And all, all of those perceptions are just simply reinforced by a TV show that they see. And they see it, but they don't really watch it. Like if you really look at dirty jobs, you you see that I'm, I'm not a host. I'm a guest. I'm a dilettante. I, it's for, it's Groundhog's Day in a sewer for me. You know, <laughs> my, my, my job is to, is to be a, a proxy, right? Like a, like an avatar for yeah. the viewer 
not an expert. So to answer your question, you, you kind of have to start, I think, with, with what most people assume to be true about me. And then you go back to, you know, I'm seven or maybe eight years old growing up next to the greatest handyman of all time, who happened to be my grandfather, a guy named Carl Noble. And Pop uh, dropped out of the seventh grade to go to work back in 1919, I think. Went on to become an electrician, steam fitter, pipe fitter, mechanic, um, uh, carpenter. He, he could build a house, Evan, without a blueprint. In fact, he did, the one I was born in. So I grew up on a little farm on a hill in Baltimore County, just my brothers and me and my mom and dad next to my grandpa and my grandmother. And um, from the very earliest days, I was convinced that I would follow in his footsteps. I worked as his apprentice for, for as long as I can remember, right up until I was about 15, 16 years old. And... Um, and that was the summer I learned that just because you love something doesn't mean you can't suck at it. You know, I, I completely bitched up a concrete pour, uh, hung the drywall, about three bubbles off plumb. Um, just the stuff that came so easily and instinctively to him didn't come easily to me. And I was miserable when I realized that I brought home a sconce from Woodshop thing was looked like a paramecium you know my pop put it on his wall anyway he was always <laughs> encouraging <laughs> but but we finally got to the point during during my summer of humiliation where he just said look mike you can you can be a tradesman if that's what you want it's really just a state of mind what you need is a different toolbox and so he was the first guy who made me think differently about uh, ability and skill versus hopes and dreams. And I guess maybe the simplest way to say it was when I was 16 years old, I was like one of those contestants on American Idol who shows up to audition absolutely certain that they've got a shot, only to learn on national TV that they can't carry a tune in a bucket, right? And so from that point on, it was just a long, slow accumulation of new tools. You know, I, I had a scout master who taught me how to box and taught me how to shoot. I learned to shoot in the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. um, he also made me memorize long bits of poetry like the cremation of Sam McGee and um, dangerous Dan McGrew. And I would have to recite these things around the campfire at these giant Boy Scout jamborees, which was nerve wracking because I yeah. was like a painfully shy kid. I had a weird stammer, you know? So I'm stuttering through the cremation of Sam McGee and not having a great time, but being exposed to poetry and all kinds of things that I would otherwise never been exposed to. He taught me how to sing. Can't stutter when you sing. So I started memorizing these songs and performing them, you know, around the campfire when I was a kid. Then I then I had a, a mentor in high school, a, a, a music teacher who cured me of my stutter. Fred King was his name. Made me, a, made me audition for a play. St I, I literally stammered through a monologue from uh, Cyrano. And he stopped me about 20 seconds in. I knew I was going to completely crap the bed. But he stopped me and said, hey, Mikey, Mikey, I love what you're doing with the character. But this character doesn't, doesn't stutter. You stutter on your own time. <laughs> I know it sounds glib, but like in that second, I thought, oh, I can act like a guy who doesn't stutter. And then, you know, how it goes. Another door opens. I wound up going to a community college and, and, and studied acting and studied singing and studied writing and a whole lot of things that I didn't think I was interested in. And then my voice changed. I had a very low voice at a young age. So I started narrating these uh, nature documentaries for National Geographic. I was only really? 20. Oh, yeah. Dude, if there was a wildebeest trying to cross the vast reaches of the barren Serengeti, <laughs> only to peel away from the herd and then be eaten by hyenas or crocodiles at the watering hole, the odds were very good. It was me telling you about it. And um, by the way, sidebar, never leave the herd, especially if you're a wildebeest. It's just, it's not going to work out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Wildebeest, the wildebeest that are listening to the show, don't leave your hurt. Yeah. 
So I'm narrating shows for the National Geographic. I'm I'm auditioning for plays. I wind up auditioning for the Baltimore Opera to get my union card. I don't really want to sing opera, but I go to the library. I learn the shortest aria I can. I crash an open audition last Thursday of every month. They used to have them. Somehow, somehow, they they let me in. And uh, the music was better than I thought. And, dude, the girls, oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> So I mean I'm I'm 22 at this point. There are, there are 80 people in the rep company. 45 of them are women. 35 are guys. Right. Uh, 30 of the 35 guys have zero interest in 100 percent of the women. Right. And uh, of the remaining five straight dudes, the three were married, and the only other single guy <laughs> had a. Had a mole on his eyelid the size of my thumb with thick black <laughs> hair growing out of it. So, you know, there I am, 22, dressed as a Viking, um, singing Verdi and Vivaldi and Puccini and all this stuff with a world-class orchestra. I, I, I stayed for eight years. And um, along the way, I, my toolbox fattened up. You know, I, got a, I learned I was pretty good at sales. I sold magazines over the phone. I sold water purifiers out of my trunk. I negotiated service contracts for some company called Computerland. I don't think they're around anymore, but I didn't even know how to operate a computer, but I was selling service contracts by day and singing Italian at night and and dating all the girls I could find. And and so, yeah, by the time I was 28, I had done a fair amount of work in what was turning out to be my chosen field. I had a toolbox with stuff in it that made sense to my brain. And my pop was right. I, I began working as a tradesman or as a jobber, right? right? I, I always looked at the work in this ridiculous industry I'm in, the way a tradesman looks at laying pipe. Just a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so I had, before Dirty Jobs came along, I don't know, probably 200 jobs in the entertainment business, narrating, hosting, writing, singing, all sorts of stuff that would make absolutely no sense to the brain of a serious Dirty Jobs fan who found that show all those years later and made all kinds of assumptions. So uh, with, with opera, do you... Do you still listen to opera? Do you like it? Do you do you go to the opera? Do you participate in it? Is something part of your life that will always be there? Or is it just part of your history? Again, I'm not sure it's door number one or door number two. Yeah. You know, it's it's certainly a part of my history. And, yeah. and the longer I live, the more interested people seem to be in it. Really? I was I was the answer on a Jeopardy question last week. This former opera singer, blah, 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 blah. Really? Like, oh, yeah. 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 And so, you know, I think, I think today people are, are interested in those stories that don't line up evenly. So, mm-hmm. but to answer your question, I, I haven't been to the opera in years. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still friends with some of the people that I met back in 1984 in Baltimore, right. Maryland, where we sang, you know, three nights a week at the Lyric Opera House. But um No, music, I mean, music in general is a huge part of my life still, but I was never a pro. You know, I, I, that guy I mentioned, Fred King, who fixed my stutter, he was, um, he was a world champion barbershop quartet singer. And he put me in a barbershop quartet when I was in high school. And so, you know, looking back, music in general, I was a saloon singer, an opera singer, an acapella quartet singer. Uh, but really, I never thought of myself as a singer. I, I just thought of myself as a guy who was trying to trying to get his toolbox together. And if that paid right. the bills for a little while, I would, well, I would do that, you right. know, but way leads on the way. And so right. I never, it's not like I ever got over it. I just never got really great at it, but it's weird, dude. I like <laughs> yesterday on my podcast, Chuck and I, uh, who sang in that old quartet with me 40 yeah. years ago. He's a producer on the podcast. We started singing jingles for our sponsors. <laughs> Just started making up jingles for ZipRecruiter and stuff. Yeah. Um, mostly to amuse ourselves, but but also I think just 
kind of to remind each other that there's always a, a weirder way or a different way to do a thing. Right. And podcasting being what it is now, right? I mean, I'm sure you've learned this too. You have to be your own thing. Um, you have to fit. You know, you got to get in the machine, but you also have to somehow differentiate yourself, which you've turned out to be pretty good at. Um, but it's the same riddle for everybody. Right. You know, use whatever's in your toolbox to make yourself as interesting as possible. Well, in watching you over the past, because you know, I've, I've I'm a little bit younger, I would imagine, but we have similar similar things in our background. So my my grandfather was he built his own house. He was the he was the grave digger in a very small town of 400 people. He was the grave digger. He's the TV repairman. He was the electrician. He was the saw because there's a logging community. So he repaired saws. He did everything. So it was anything and everything to uh, put a dollar away and then ultimately feed his family. But I grew up, you know, in, in the backo and in the shop with both, you know, he and my father, because they were, they were, they weren't professional handymen. They were, they were professionals at, at fixing things. And, uh, and they were just the jack of all trades. My grandfather more so than my father. My my dad, honestly, he couldn't hang a a sheet of uh, of, of uh, sheetrock to save his if he had a gun to his head if it was yeah. even. But he can weld like an artist. So he can put two pieces of steel together, and that was like part of his his passion and his profession for years. As he was like working on logging trucks and you know those dirty jobs. Those were all my family members because I grew up in a very rural community in Northern Idaho where everybody was, you know, logging or ditch digging or one of those things where you'd kind of like unpack for specifics. But how north up there were you? Like Quarter Lane? Yeah, Bonner's yeah just, just south. So uh, Quarter Lane, uh, if you went south or to basically a line directly south, there's a small logging town out there called Pierce and we have, there's two of them. Uh, there are about 400, 500 in population. And that's basically where I grew up. It's about an hour and a half south of Coeur d'Alene. Beautiful um, part of the country. But you know, the thing about your pop, you know, I, back in the day, he he was heroic. I mean, guys <laughs> like that, they they could literally save the town, you know. And a lot of townspeople, I would bet, in your in your home, you know, would would look at him with something like, like reverence, you know, because oh, yeah. he could he could save your bacon for real, and that that was my pop. He had, he was like a superhero without a cape, you know. And part of the reason dirty jobs happened was just because guys like that today are they're not invisible, but they're they're transparent. We just kind of look through them, you know. We just don't value that that level of skill and expertise the way that we used to. Do you think, you know, to transition away into that, which is like, I value. So, so for me as an individual, I, I really value uh, my, what I would say, you know, defined as the blue collar uh, perspective, which is, this is, these are my family members. These are majority of my friends, you know, executives, even in the company, they just kind of drive me a little bit nuts. Uh, <laughs> not because I don't appreciate and love what they do. I just, I, uh, communication wise with, you know, candor in uh, when we're communicating across the board, I grew up, obviously we just talked about it in a very blue collar community with my father and my uncles and everybody surrounding me in a very blue collar family. And I think over the last 20 years, I, you know, and, and I'm not sure how much you know of me, but I was a green beret for a while. And then I went oh, over yeah. to the CIA and um, I've I've always been directly immersed into these this culture, and for lack of a better term, and it's really it bothered me, and I didn't understand why for so many years when I went on to college, and the way that people would would talk about my my family, the people that I loved, yeah, it would fucking irritate me, and it still does today. Like it yep. really would irritate. Um, do you think that's gotten worse? Do you think it's, do you think it's, do you think it's just kind of stayed constant? Do you think, where did this division start and why? 
Because well, for you, it, for you, it sounds like it might have gotten worse, Evan. <laughs> I, it, no, I get it. I get it. it. It irritates me because I what I don't like about it, Mike, is that people have a perception of stupidity associated with with them where you have more of that, what we'll call them the university educated from the master's and PhD level. And then if you're a tradesman, there is a level of communication and the perception of a lower IQ, which is absolutely inaccurate because yeah. I've spent so much time around people that are creatively problem solving to include your grandfather that built a house without plans. Like they just, people don't have the perception, I think, because there's a disassociation with that IQ, but that's well, me ranting. No, well, look, I mean, you, you come by it honestly, obviously you're a professional soldier. Um, you, you worked for a long time in one of the last remaining meritocracies in the country. You, you, you can't afford to take your stigmas and your stereotypes and your prejudices and your misconceptions and assign those things uh, during a life and death situation. If you do, well, you know, you, you're going to take it in the neck and that's right. a dumb way to die. It's, it's, right. it's stupid. <laughs> it's, it's, it's stupid to, it's an unforced error yeah. and a self-inflicted kind of wound to, to not see what's best in the men or women on either side of you. That's true in combat and it's true in our workforce. And it's also true in our educational system. And to answer your question, you know, I, for me, for me, it went off the rails in my guidance counselor's office. You know, I, I run a foundation called MicroWorks. We give away, a, you know, a couple million bucks a year in work ethic mm -hmm. scholarships. And um, I can tell you how that foundation evolved later if you want. But, yeah. but it, it, one of the inciting incidents, and again, I didn't know this at the time, but it happened in Mr. Dunbar's office. <laughs> Mr. Dunbar in 1979 is guidance counselor at Overly Senior High School in Baltimore. And um, in those days, uh, college was in the midst of a giant PR campaign. We needed more people in the 60s and 70s to look at higher education and apply themselves to mm -hmm. go for four-year degrees. We, we really did need more of that um, because we obviously we want to compete at the highest levels on the world stage. And we had a dearth of highly educated people. So college got a big, a big PR push. And um, part of that push were a series of these posters. And one of these posters was hanging in Mr. Dunbar's office. I'll describe it in a second, but he called me to his office to talk about my future. I'd taken some tests, done pretty well. And he said, look, you can get into University of Pennsylvania, James Madison, maybe even some of the Ivies, you know, here's what you need to do. And here's the paperwork you're going to want to fill out for, uh, for student loans. And, you know, I'm 17. I, I don't know my ass from a hot rock. Um, I have no idea what I want to do. My toolbox has not yet been assembled. Remember, I had just learned that <laughs> my hopes and dreams were wildly, uh, you know, inconsistent with my, with my skill sets. And so, and plus I didn't have any money, right. you know, and the only four letter word that was really off limits in, in my house growing up was debt. And there was just no way I was going to borrow money to yeah. go to a school to get trained for something that I didn't even know I wanted to do. So I told Mr. Dunbar, I said, look, man, I, I I'm going to go to a community college. It's called Essex Community College. I can literally walk to it from my house and at 26 bucks a credit. I, I can afford to be wrong, right? I, 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 can, right. I, yeah. I, can, I can afford to study anything I want, you know, right. philosophy, music, math, what, whatever. And he says, Mike, that would be a colossal waste of your, of your time and your life. Don't, 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 don't do that. And then he points to this poster behind his desk. It was hanging on the wall and uh, it was a split screen. On the left, there was, what if I have one of them around here? I probably do because I recreated it. But on the left-hand side, you got a kid in a cap and gown. 
right. holding his diploma out in front of him. The sun is setting somewhere in front of him. He's beautifully lit, and you can see his whole life unfolding before him. And next to him is a guy who actually looks like my grandfather. And he's dressed as a mechanic, and he's standing in some grease pit, some godforsaken pit of despair, holding a wrench, right. looking like he just lost or or won some vocational consolation prize, right? And Mr. Dunbar says, which one of these guys do you want to be? And then at the bottom of the poster, I'm not making this up, is the single most annoying platitude in the history of bad advice. At the bottom of this poster, it says, work smart, not hard. (laughs) And so I'm standing there going, you know, son of a bitch, this guy is actually, he's using my grandfather as a cautionary tale to tell me that if I'm not careful, I'm going to wind up turning a wrench. Right. So, you know, what happened There's a long way to answer your question, but part of the disconnect you're talking about and part of the reason we have so many misperceptions and stigmas that persist today Mm -hmm. is because back in 1979, we weren't just, promoting higher education as a legitimate pursuit in and of itself, we were, we were beginning to tell a whole generation of kids that if they didn't borrow whatever it took to take that path, then they would wind up screwed. So we started promoting one form of education at the expense of Mm -hmm. all the others. That's where it started around the same time we started taking shop class out of high school. Right. And brother, the unintended consequences of that, those chickens are still coming home to roost. And by the way, we didn't flip a switch. We didn't do it overnight. You know, some secretary of labor didn't pick up the phone and say, Hey, I've been thinking it over. Let's get rid of shop class. They, um, they started about 10 years earlier, back when it was called uh, the vocational arts and they took the art out of it. And then it was just, vocational training. And that became Votech. Right. Once you yeah. hyphenate something, right? It's only a matter yeah. of time. Yeah. And then Votech became shop. And then they walked it around the back of the barn and they shot it in the head. And shop class is gone from high school. Kids can't see optically any of these careers, these, these great jobs that are available to them. Instead, all they get is Mr. Dunbar type advice, which is borrow whatever it takes to get yeah. into the right school. Flash forward to today. Here you and I are sitting here, 2022. $1.7 trillion in student loans on the books. 11.4 million open positions right now that for whatever reason, look too much like work to get right. people interested. Yeah, Those jobs, they don't, they don't require a four-year degree. They, they require training. Mm-hmm. They require the kinds of education that Mr. Dunbar was affirmatively disparaging. And so, yeah, man, I, I, forgive me for the soapbox, but that, that's what got us here. This, this idea that cookie cutter advice was smart, that we could somehow move forward as a country by working smart and not hard mm-hmm. instead of doing both. Right. And um, just just telling a whole generation of kids that the best path for the most people was the most expensive path, even as our government freed up a bottomless well of money and we pressured people to borrow it at whatever cost. And so, yeah, a lot of stupid things have happened over the last 45, 50 years. And it's interesting because I think about it, just my own stupidity and really not it's just ignorance. Because I went to college and I worked on a farm in the summertime. I joined uh, the the National Guard while I was in college so I could offset the cost of tuition. You know, I worked on a farm because I didn't know how to loan money. That's how stupid I was. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, when you don't, when you don't even understand, I'm like, what? The government's going to give you money? There's got to be a hang up. You know, there, there's got to be some type of hang up here. Like I. I, I, I'm going to figure it out on my own. Like I'll just take the summers, you know, and, and, you know, you'd work for cash. And the, the interesting thing that's been broken in my 
brain, which I've been fortunate enough to have, is my parents never deterred me from hard work. They always lifted it as if you work hard, and that could be through using you know, your just sheer muscle or you know intellectual prowess. However, you're 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 leveraging your skill set and your 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 physical form. Things will start to happen. I never once in my life, like like hard work was so incredibly emphasized and appreciated. It was not only, it was culturally unacceptable to be lazy. It was not something that you could be. Yeah. It was such a derogatory term. If I were to come back and, and hear it rolling off my uncle or my grandfather or my father, or anyone's tongue, laziness was 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 literally one of the worst or most one of the, the, the derogatory terms that they would use to emphasize somebody. So yes. for me, there's no, there's never been another way. And for hard work, because I saw this so I was so aware of this, especially early in my 20s, I would see this bifurcation where you'd have people that just didn't want to work. They didn't, it wasn't that they weren't capable of it. It's just by choice. They really didn't want to use their hands. They really didn't want to, to, to dig in and want to work. Whereas like for myself, I was looking for ways where I could jump out of airplanes and go into the jungle and work really hard or do something incredibly difficult. And it was always seen as you're a weirdo. It, it, to be honest, I was like a, kind of an outlier in that regard. Like what? I remember no. having this conversation. All my buddies were taking the LSAT because they wanted to, they were going to go to law school. And I was like, that sounds horrible. I don't want to do that. I'm going to go yeah. like try to, you know, overthrow, uh, you know, regimes. There you go. You know? <laughs> That's what I'm going to try to do. Cause that sounds more interesting. They're like, Oh man, you're, you're a crazy person. That sounds horrible. That's, that's, that's going to be just brutal. I'm like, it sounds way more fun to me to do that than what you're going to do for the next four years, taking the LSAT and going on to law school. But, 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 but think about like, do you think you were born that way? Do you no. think they were born that way? Look, I, I don't either. I think no. we have to be carefully taught. Mm -hmm. We've got to be taught good habits. We don't have to be taught bad habits. My view anyway. I mean, I, you take a two year old and, sit him next to another two-year-old and one of them has a truck and the other one wants the truck. And so that one picks up a wooden spoon and bashes the other one over the head and takes the truck. You know, this is, this is how we're born. We're, we're born selfish. We're born lazy. We're born thinking that if we're in a solar system, then we are the sun. Right. And everything rotates around us. And if if we're raised in a way that reinforces that natural fault in our stars, then you're going to wind up going down a, a series of roads that are going to take you to a place. If, on the other hand, you're lucky enough to have a grandfather next door who will tell you the truth about your limitations when you're young enough and old enough to understand it, um, if, if you're lucky enough to have parents or mentors in your life who will push you onto the part of the map that says, here be dragons or make you do the uncomfortable thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's what worries me today more than anything. We're not allowed to do that. Teachers right. aren't allowed to interact with me the way Mr. King did. Right. right? Scout masters. My God, you know, there's just no, in, in 1978, literally my, my troop had a boxing ring where right. kids could settle their differences with a referee on hand. Mm -hmm. I wasn't kidding when I said we, we learned to shoot rifles and handguns in the Boy Scouts. My scoutmaster was a, was a retired lieutenant colonel who ran the troop like it was a platoon. That's so, awesome. you know, you can't do that today. No. You, uh -huh. you can't deliberately put a kid, what we would call it now, in harm's way and see it as something colossally irresponsible. Back then, it was just about trying to sharpen the virtues that could only come from being uncomfortable. And so, man, talk about lessons. I, I still remember Mr. Huntington <laughs> telling us, look, it's not like, like the way to get through 
misery is not to endure it. Yeah. It's to like it. Yeah. It's to figure out a way to, what do you guys say? Embrace the suck. Yeah. Embrace right? the suck. Yeah. Embrace it. Right. It's fun. Can that, I that, I mean, every single, well, I hate to talk in platitudes, but every single successful person who I admire, who, who, who earned their money, who did the hard thing to get it, those people haven't found a way to endure. They've found a way to enjoy the challenge, the pain, the heartbreak, the failure, the misery. And that's Dirty Jobs 101, man. Once you realize your job is to take the pie in the face, make friends with the pie. Right. I, and I think that's what, where I admire people and their professions. And I find it, it fascinating. And one of the reasons why, from a company's perspective, when, when we when we started building the company, it's really just to satisfy my own curiosity at times where I think we can make that. I think I can hire that. I think I can pull that inside. And I think I can sew this or manufacture that. In it, at times it's, it's costly. When you think about, <laughs> you know, uh, pulling in-house manufacturing and, and hiring people and trying to build culture and, and all of these like really, they're, they're fascinating problems to solve. But that's all really difficult work. And from my perspective, I get to work in this laboratory, which is the company. And I get to see all the different types of individual professions that get to either be in-house or out-house. And it, I get to do this every day. So why wouldn't I not be excited to roll out of bed at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning and hit my, as soon as my feet hit the ground, I'm like, great, I get to do it all over again. Every day, all day long, I get to solve problems and find really fascinating things about the company that I can dive into. It's somewhat selfish, to be, to be fair. It's, it's somewhat selfish. As it should be. Look, yeah. most, most great endeavors are, are selfish. Most philanthropic endeavors are selfish. We think about it all wrong. You know, I'm not a real Ayn Randian, but mm -hmm. I've read her books and yeah. I think I think she was right about more than a few things. And and the big thing has to do with the trap of altruism. Yeah. You know, I, I did a hundred episodes of a show for Facebook called Returning the Favor a couple of years ago. Um Won an Emmy. Look there. Hey, can you see is my Emmy? It? Okay, in the shot. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> I can see it. Is Sorry. that? Did it really? What a is that it? thing to do. Yeah, yeah. I, I literally won an Emmy for returning the favor, and they canceled it two weeks later. the The only thing I've ever won an Emmy for, and the the last thing I ever thought I would get noticed for. But the point of that show was just to reward decent people in little communities you couldn't find on a map who were doing yeah. nice things for their neighbors. It was a straight up look at uh, altruism, philanthropy uh, in neighbors that you wish you had, right? right? And people just absolutely loved the show. But what I learned after profiling dozens of these 501Cs was that the people who were running them by and large <laughs> were doing it for selfish reasons. They yeah. got off mm -hmm. on being good. Mm -hmm. it, it, it fired them up. It made them feel good. They weren't, they weren't doing it simply to save someone who needed help. They were doing it because it, it magnified something inside of them. And look, you, you, I'm sure you saw that in the service. You see, oh, yeah. it with, you see it with good cops. You see mm -hmm. it with good firemen. You see it with anybody who's willing to, to, put their nuts on a block for a heavenly cause, right? Something bigger than themselves, but they're not, oftentimes, they're not doing it simply to help. They're doing it because it makes them feel alive. And so that when, when you say it feels selfish, mm -hmm. it's because it is in the best possible way. You've got, you must have close to a hundred people working for you now. A thousand, yeah, a thousand, <laughs> a thousand people too. Yeah. <laughs> Look, you're you're succeeding for a lot of reasons, but the two big ones, from what I know of you, yeah, you roast great coffee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the product's good. By the way, it's my third AK forty seven oh. of the morning. Cheers. Yeah, and I'm having it in one of these. Have you seen these things before? These embers? 
Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I got one. Uh, they were Kickstarter back in the day. Yeah. And I got one of those, like one of their first Kickstarter things. I love those things. I'm not a gadget guy, but yeah. you know, I do. I spend a lot of time in my office now right. staring at my Emmy award, talking to people <laughs> like you. So I got this little recharging thing. The thing is awesome. I keep my AK 47 piping hot <laughs> for three hours at a time. It's amazing. Anyway, look, you, you know, the value of enjoying misery. Mm-hmm. And the thing you just said before, um, not selfish, but amuse. Sometimes you feel like you're amusing yourself. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's it, right? Those two things alone, I think, not to turn this into some sort of half-baked motivational podcast, yeah. but those two things alone, if you figured out how to enjoy misery and you know the value of amusing yourself, you're going to win. I mean, every comedian who I admire, yeah. well, when I look at them on stage doing their thing, I, they're not trying to make me laugh. <laughs> no. They're yeah. trying to make themselves. They're, try, they're, they're first and foremost focused on doing the best work they can by their metric, right? right. And look, it's the same thing with singing. You know, mm-hmm. the best singers in the world uh, have mastered their technique, but <laughs> the last thing you want to see from an audience standpoint is some guy who's in love with his technique. You don't want to see the technique. Right. You just want to see somebody singing beautifully or telling a great joke or a mm-hmm. really good story. So the technique has to become so mastered that it then becomes invisible. And that that starts with understanding who you're trying to entertain first and foremost. And the answer better be you. Mm -hmm. So, so if you're first and foremost focused on entertaining yourself, and if you don't feel guilty because you're selfish in ways that matter most, and if you're not afraid to enjoy the pain, yeah, man, you're going to have 2000 employees before long (laughs) and franchisees all over the country. And is that the plan? Is that what you're going to do? Yeah, we we do both. We have like corporate and uh, we have corporate and franchisees. We've got both. We're, we're, I think we'll finish the year at 30, uh, 30 stores. We, I think we're going to have 40 franchisees by the end of next year, something like that. Um, You know, from our perspective and it's, it's somewhat irrelevant, but, you know, from a company's perspective, it's, it's fascinating. Like I was just on an earnings call. So I do my earnings call every quarter and we talk to analysts about the business and, you know, I'm, I'm a logger son and I'm running a public company. It's, it's wild <laughs> when, when, you, when you put it into perspective, you pull the lens back. And I started thinking about this because in the context of our conversation, and I was listening to you and the best soldiers that I knew were the, the, the best people I knew they were guided by this, the, the, this passion, ultimately this love, right? They had a love for their profession. They had a love for their country. They had all these inroads into what they really felt were, were, were emotional ties to what they were doing that gave you the capacity to endure and we always called it, we were artisans of our craft. We were mm. always, we were practicing the art of war in which a lot of people just couldn't understand that in, in the context of how could you be an artisan of your craft and warfare? I'm like, well, for from American terms, this was the longest stretch uh, in, in modern history that you could practice uh, the, the art of war. And so for a lot of us that managed to kind of spend a decade plus, I I did, you know, a decade plus in, in, in and out of theaters, it was not only a love for country, but it became, it's, it's fascinating. Like as a, just a direct participant in the actual art of war, it's addicting not because of necessarily the adrenaline, it's because what you're, what you're incorporating in is physics and psychology and teamwork, all of these different aspects to solve a problem, what is so acutely difficult that also allows you to access 
the highest high of emotional reward and the lowest low of emotional defeat, all within sometimes fractions of a second. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, man. Who said the famous line? You know, it's uh, moments of unending, inexplicable boredom interrupted by seconds of sheer terror. Right. (laughs) God. It's like fishing for crab on the Bering Sea, you know, flat, dead calm, bored to death, sweating your ass off. Temperature drops 45 degrees. Sleet comes in sideways. You're in 30 foot swells, green water coming over the bow and you're still hauling pots. It's, it's like, what just happened? <laughs> and that what just happened? And what is the, the makeup of when I looked at, when I look at those professions out there that were also what I felt were very dangerous and dirty, those were the, the, some of the most intriguing aspects of those, those jobs, which was the dark, deep, cold water. Yeah. 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 To me, that's, that's terrifying. Like I, it is terrifying. Yep. So those guys do that day in, day out, like day in, day out. Yep. And the reps that they must have and the amount of, of um, I guess, the, the myelination of, of the, the synapse of like just hardened endurance for these guys to continue and just forget about it. They're like tightrope walking or whatever it is for a profession every day. But That's you right. get this unique insight into those guys that you've had for years. Yep. It had to be like, not only fascinating, but what are the things that were the most fascinating about doing this? Oh, it well, sounds like a trite question, but it's not because I've got to know. No, no it, well, you've you're the answer is in the question, right? You talk when you talk about the art of war, it's not much different than talking about the art of work or the right. art of mining or the right. art of fishing. Um, you know, the stakes might be a little higher, um, and of course, you it's all shot through the lens of of patriotism. Right. But again, that's the, that thing you're talking about is very Shakespearean. We few, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers, right? Yeah. The band of brothers mentality that you're describing in the service means that you probably found a way to pull all kinds of practical jokes, to laugh yourself sick, You probably behaved, you probably channeled your inner eight-year-old on more than one occasion with your buddies. Every day. did some crazy, (laughs) stupid shit (laughs) that made you laugh so hard, you know, the snot bubbles came out of your mouth and you just lost control of your O-rings and whatnot. And look, that, that gallows sense of humor, that irreverence, that exists in opal mines, on crab boats. It exists on the top of cell phone towers when these guys are, you know, 900 feet in the air, uh, assembling and disassembling the very platforms they're standing on again and again and again. Um, It's the real gift for me after 350 dirty jobs and 20 years of deadliest catch is finding that sensibility in hundreds of unlikely locations in a sewer. When you find the band of brothers mentality in a sewer, then you have to ask yourself questions like, what do these, what do these guys know that I don't, you know, what, what can, as a group, what do dirty jobbers know that, that so many of the rest of us have forgotten. And look, I can say the same thing about farmers. I can say the same thing about the military. Isn't it funny how it's almost always like one, one and a half percent of the population who yeah. is doing a thing <laughs> that's keeping the entire uh, system together. One and a half percent wear the uniform. One and a half percent of people in this country feed 330 million people three times a day, plus half the rest of the world. You know, those people who are in those small percentages, but who are doing what we now call essential work, they know it. They're in, I used to say they're in on the joke. 
which mm-hmm. was an inelegant way of saying they they just understand something that you can't understand unless you're actually a part of it. They know, for instance, that if they all call in sick, the wheels come off the bus. Right. <laughs> they know that their work matters, even if the bulk of the population, the fat part of the bat, has forgotten it. They know. And so that is why I suspect guys like you were attracted to the military and why so many people I've met along the way are are attracted to the vocations that they've chosen. They know that they can foster a meaningful connection among their colleagues, and they know that their work actually matters. They're the guy on Mr. Dunbar's poster who's holding the wrench, who actually know the real score. They're your pop Mm -hmm. up there in Idaho, fixing TVs and building houses. They know, you know, and, uh, and that makes, that puts them in the minority and it makes them the most interesting bipeds around. Right. But out of the jobs that you've had an inside look into, what, what, what is this, the, the scariest situation you found yourself in where you've been like, I don't like this. This is really uncomfortable. I, I'm, I, I'm a lot of body knows, you know, where, yeah, yeah. where, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, how many times you found yourself in there and there's there one or two or 10 or whatever that stick out in your mind is like, this is, this is it. This is, this is like, I don't like this. There are probably about 50. Really? Where, yeah. I mean, remember my job is not to succeed. My yeah. job is to try. Right. So I'm never going to not, try, but you're really talking about the pucker factor, you know, Mm -hmm. like have I ever like really seized up? And, um, and the answer is, yeah, I think, I think early on during shark week, a terrible thing happened, man. I, I, uh, (laughs) I, I was invited to help build a shark suit or the hell that is. And I go down to the uh, Bahamas and meet this guy, uh, Jeremiah Sullivan. He invented the shark suit, his stainless steel suit. Yeah. You know, this is way back, like 2004. Um, nobody had seen any of these things on TV before. And I, I made one with him. Lots of TIG right. welding. And, you know, you basically, you look like Lancelot in this thing. Yeah, yeah. Of course, Jeremiah, he's basically an aquatic Indiana Jones. You know, right. the guy is just a monster. And he's like, well, let's test it. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the point in making one if you don't test it? So we agreed to uh, to test this shark suit, which basically involves going a couple of miles offshore and chum in the water and just filling it with blood and wait right. till 30 or 40 reef sharks show up. Big suckers, eight, 10 feet long. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, in full scuba gear, wearing a shark suit, you just jump in. And... Uh, you, they follow you down to the ocean floor and you kneel on the floor about 60 feet down. You look up, you can see the bottom of the boat, the tiny little thing. And all around you are sharks just bumping into you, bouncing off your chest. And then he opens up this, uh, this other container of chum and you literally put it on you. The sharks don't want to bite you instinctively, but they will. And once right. they start, once they start, dude, holy shit, man. They, they're, there was a moment I had a shark on my arm, one on my left arm, right shoulder, left leg. And they sh- shake you like a tug toy. Right. I mean, and, you know, you're just thinking this is, this is it. I mean, this is just it. Meanwhile, Jeremiah, he's three feet from me. He's upside down. He's got a shark on his innermost thigh. Must have been 10 feet long. And this thing is shaking him. He's got him upside down. And another shark swims between us and his back fin knocks the regulator out of Jeremiah's mouth. So now I'm 60 feet down. Jeremiah is next to me. There's blood all over the place. I don't know if it's mine, his, or the chum. And the, and the sharks are everywhere. And I'm just thinking, my God, you know, what, what the hell am I doing? The, the story... <laughs> I just told you the end of the story. The, the terrifying part 
of the story actually never aired. And it happened the night before. After we made the shark suit, we agreed to test the thing the next morning. But I said, look, I can't, I can't put my crew in the water. You know, they're going to need shark suits too. Right. And we're going to shoot this thing properly. Yeah. And we're going to be at depth. So I got to, I got to make sure I understand how the communications are going to work. We need to test all the audio. And I just want to make sure everybody is just not completely going to shit the bed. Right. I mean, right. this is, this is a crazy thing we're going to do the next morning. So we, and there's a reporter there from TV guide, a guy named Leon. He, he, he comes into this momentarily. Anyhow, it's the night before the shoot and the sun's going down and the, you know, the, the, the water's all purpley and we throw some chum in and sure enough the the, the sharks are there and I got my gear on and my shark and my suit and my, my heart's just going a mile a minute, you know, and I, I get in the water and I get about 10 feet down and I got a problem. I can't, my nose has been broken three times in my life at that point. Right. Um, very hard for me to uh, acclimate because right. I've got a full mask on, you know, I, I, I don't have a regulator in my mouth. In other words, mm -hmm. I'm breathing compressed air through this thing that looks like a welder's shield oh, yeah. so I can talk. I also have a bicycle helmet screwed on <laughs> to the shark suit because a couple of weeks earlier, a friend of Jeremiah's got bit in the back of the head and that wasn't cool. So he didn't want that to happen. So I'm 10 feet down holding on to a, a line. I can't acclimate. The water is purple and dark. So the sharks are everywhere and my head feels like it's going to split, right? Because I'm just... You know, I, I can't decompress. Well, I finally get squared away by, by jamming, they call it a booger buster inside of the, the shield. And you jam that way up into your nose and then you exhale as hard as you can. And that, that finally cleared me up. But the moment I got my sinuses in order, an eight footer bounces off my chest. Big shark swims right into me. My heart rate now goes from probably 90 to about 130. And I just can't freaking believe we're doing this. Meanwhile, my camera guys are super experienced divers. They're about 30 feet down waiting for me. And Jeremiah is all the way at the bottom, kneeling on the ocean floor where we're going to shoot the scene right. the next morning. Anyhow, I get down there and we test the comms and everything is great. And now it's really starting to get dark. And I want to, it's like, this is enough we're good. Let's just get out of here. And I get this weird tightening feeling in my chest that I'd never experienced before. And it can't be my air because I've got 45 minutes of air and I've only been down there 15 minutes, but it was my air. I tore through 45 minutes of air in 15 <laughs> minutes because I was so jacked up. And I... <clears throat> like clear my throat, exhale and go to breathe in. And there's nothing there. My last breath at 60 feet was an exhale. Leon from TV Guide, another experienced diver, is kneeling next to me. And he immediately sees something's wrong and he grabs my gauge and he looks at it and he just shakes his head. He's like, no, dude, you're, you are O-U-T out. So he immediately takes out his respirator, his regulator, and tries to get my mask off. But it won't come off because the goddamn bicycle helmet <laughs> is screwed into the top of it. So we waste 10 seconds. Like his air is right there. Right. He's holding it out to me and I can't get it in my mouth. now. When your heart's going that fast and you're 60 feet down and your last breath is an exhale, all you want is O2. And all you can see when you look up is the bottom of your boat, six stories up. And so that's where I figured it would end for me. Plus, you know, I'm, I, got, I can't flood my BC. I got, I got no air. And I got a 45 pound suit of armor. So I'm, I am an anvil at the bottom of the ocean 
with zero air and some dude from TV Guide who's the only one who realizes what's going on. This guy grabs me with his right hand, floods his BC, and the two of us start to rise about like that, you know, about half a mile, maybe maybe a mile an hour. And um, I'm kicking as hard as I can, and I know I'm not going to make it. This is how it ends for me. Yeah, yeah. Can't get my mask off, can't get any air, and all I'm looking at is the bottom of that boat, which is slowly getting bigger and bigger as we rise toward the surface. But there are no bubbles coming out of my my deal. I I have no I have no air. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that, but you don't you don't just pass out. You you lose your uh vision first, right? And I can see it like this. I can see the periphery just closing and closing as we're rising and rising and the bottom of the boat is getting slowly larger. And I'm doing the math as best I can with what's left of the part of my brain that has blood in it. And it's just not a good equation. And, um, and, yet, and yet somehow we broke the surface and all that stuff got ripped off of me. And I started breathing again. And um, I got back on the boat. Barsky was up there. My producer, Doug and Troy, made it up. You know, they all knew something weird had happened, but they weren't sure what. And I just remember sitting there. To answer your question, the hardest thing I ever did, at that point anyway, on that show, was wake up the next morning and put that goddamn shark suit back <laughs> on and flood the water with blood and jump back in. That, that was the single hardest thing I remember doing up to that point. There was another one, but that, as of 2006, I guess, that was it. I've always wondered about that. I've never talked to somebody about those shark suits. So that has to feel the pressure, the, the <laughs> jaws. Uh, wh- well, that what does that feel like? Like, I, what does yeah. it feel like? It's well, it it, it feels exact. It, it feels like pressure without yeah. the teeth. Right. One one tooth got through. One tooth on my right. shin, and I still have. Yeah, you know, I don't know if this is a video thing, but I still have the scar. Look, just like that. It's right. an episode of <laughs> it, it's Jaws, right? It's. <laughs> But yeah, one little tooth got through and into my uh, into my shin bone, and it you know bothered me for a while. But that was the the worst of it was the next morning getting out of bed and walking to the bathroom, and you know every bite left a a bone bruise, right? You know, and so you don't you don't realize it when it's happening because you got a lot of other stuff going on in your head, and it's not like you're bleeding or anything, but yeah, you feel it the next day, for sure. Because it has to like pull the, I mean, the, just the bruising and the muscles being pulled and then the clamp with the pressure and then the 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 being jerked around. Mm-hmm. I've seen it. I've seen it. I, I was a huge Jacques Cousteau fan when I was a kid. So oh, man, me like too. All of yeah. those like, adventure stories. I've seen those suits over and over. And you you never get the opportunity to talk to somebody that's actually been there and been inside that suit because it doesn't look like it should work. It, it really doesn't. It doesn't look like it doesn't look like it should work. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. No. no, especially when you make it. Like imagine <laughs> yeah. you've never made one before, and right. now you're making one. And now the inventor is like, "Hey, yeah, let's put it on and see if it works." And you're thinking, "I'm just, I just feel like the frog in the boiling water. You know, it's getting a little <laughs> warmer and pretty." And the next thing you know. You're on the bottom of the ocean, you know, dressed up like Ivanhoe, hoping for the best. But, dude, the other thing is, it's everything you've said is true, but there's also years of primal programming in your brain. Like, you've seen Jaws. You've seen lots of other movies. You've read books. And so, it doesn't matter how, uh, how sophisticated you are or how enlightened you are. When you look straight in to that flat, black, lifeless eye, like a dull's eye, right? When you, <laughs> yeah. when, you, when you look into the eye of a thing that can eat you, 
right? Um, that that's that's a heck of a thing. A lion, you know, a cheetah, yeah. uh, a shark, you know, th- these things can freaking eat you for real. And um, yeah, until until you're in that really in that moment, I don't think you people fully appreciate the uh, the sound that your sphincter will make when it <laughs> slams shut because it will slam, man. Well, and that guy, how many times has he done that? Been bitten by a shark in suits? It, I'm, I'm imagining this guy's been bitten hundreds of times at this point. If he's there's if a he's clip still around, there's a clip online, and yeah, but people should. <laughs> Jeremiah Sullivan is his name, All and right, um, I'm gonna have to look at this. There, there's plenty of footage out there, but there's a moment. I guess it's in. Yeah, I think it must have been in the same shoot where I look at him. We're suiting up on the back of his boat, and I say, "How many, how many times have you been bit?" And his answer is, "Oh, many thousands of times." <laughs> <laughs> many thousands of times. many thousands of times. Kind of like, kind of like you would say, "Pass the salt," you know? Right. Many thousands of times. I'm gonna have to look that up. How many? Yeah, he's he now. He, you'd be fascinated by him. He was a guest on uh, my podcast uh, not long ago because he. He got out of Neptunic, which was the company that he he built, and started Shark Armor is what he calls it now. But the applications for the military uh-huh. are amazing. You would really enjoy talking to him because he he's made something like Kevlar, only much lighter. Mm-hmm. And I've seen him literally take a piece of this stuff and and stretch it between two boards and try and hammer a nail through it. Oh, wow. And it doesn't, and then, and then he'll pick it up and like take a drag on a cigarette and blow the smoke straight through it. So it's completely breathable. Wow. But virtually impervious to, to stabbing or slashing or anything like that. And so, you know, you think about the whole tactical to practical Mm -hmm. and vice versa Mm -hmm. applications for something like that. He's, He's close to getting a deal with the military that would be, I think, a game changer for not just divers, but for, right. you know, infantry. Yeah, that, that would be interesting. I'll have to look him up or maybe maybe we can connect later on that. I yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely hook you up. I, your, your, your listeners would, would yeah. enjoy him. How many, how many episodes do you guys, how many episodes have you done so far with your show? Million. Mil- yeah, a million. <laughs> like what? Um, so Dirty Jobs has been on every week for 20 years. Um, no, your podcast, sorry. Oh, That's the podcast? Name. Yeah. I don't know, probably 250. Really? Maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's really changed. You know, I started, yeah. it, they used to be these seven minute mysteries I wrote in, this, in the style of Paul Harvey. He used yeah. to do this thing called the rest of the story. Yeah. Uh, so I would write. I'd write one of these a week and then I just put it up and people liked them. And then that turned into a book. And then that turned into people wanted to talk about (laughs) the way I heard it. So the stories became launch pads for these deeper dives. And now the podcast is very, very similar to this one. I just invite people on who I, who I think my audience should know. And we just talk, you know, and, um, I I got there the long way, but <laughs> that's where I am now, and uh, and that's what we do. And it's a lot, you know. It's funny. It's a it's a lot easier to do an hour and a half than it is seven minutes. It is, yeah, because there's you can have a full conversation. That's like the thing that I like. I, I typically will spend like an hour, an hour and a half, like, yeah, talking to people. And I I I truly enjoy like all the people I've been able to talk to. You know are not everybody is equally as fascinating, but like guys like you that have seen so many different aspects of of professions and you've lived a considerable amount of life in the, in the, in the finite amount of years that we have, like it's, it's fascinating. So like all the things I want to ask you, so I got to have like a rapid fire session because we're coming up on time and I want to be respectful to that. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm good. My, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I got all the time you need. I I really don't have anything till noon. Oh, good. So when, how many books have you written so far and do you write them or do you pull in co-authors and things like that? And when, when you're, 
Well, let's answer the first part, and then we can. Yeah, uh, one. I've just one. I've, I've written one, and the reason I've only written one is because I'm kind of terrified that I'm going to screw up my last hobby. I love to write. I've been right. writing all my life, and you know, like anything else, whether it's singing or whatever it is, right. even podcasting. Right? If you once you monetize it, once you try and turn it into a business, then, you know, your, uh, your avocation becomes your vocation. And sometimes right. that can be great and sometimes not. And so my, my hubris is such that I can't let somebody write a book for me. I can't even collaborate really. Right. Um, and so I also didn't want to write a memoir cause it just seems so vain glorious. So I just took, 35 of my favorite short stories from the podcast. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote <laughs> sort of, it's, it's, it's half autobiography, half biography. So I write a, a story that you didn't know about someone you've heard of, followed up by a true event in my life that informed that story. And I did it 35 times and it turned into a book called The Way I Heard It. Yep. And, um, and it did well. And and now I'm supposed to do some more of them, and I just haven't had time, and I I can't bring myself to to farm it out. So and so that lends me to my next question, which is you don't have time. So what what is it that that you're doing that not only do you really enjoy, but what, what's it what's an average week or day? <laughs> what's that look like for you? Uh, so oh god. So all right. Last week, I shot two episodes of Dirty Jobs. Yep. I went to Hobbs, New Mexico to open a trade school that my foundation is involved with. While I was there, I gave a talk as part of the Distinguished Lecture Series, believe it or not. And uh, 2,000 people showed up from town in the local thing. And I, I, I spent an evening with them. The next morning I woke up and I recorded a podcast while I was on the road. Uh, that afternoon I dealt with some social media stuff and this, mm -hmm. this sounds so douchey, but look, you can't ignore that. You know, there's right. 6 million people on a Facebook page. Yeah. And, um, and I, I treat them like my boss, honestly, you know, they're, they're a big part of what I do. So I, my mom's publishing a book. So I, I posted the photo or the illustration that I want to put on the cover to see what they thought of it and mm -hmm. sort of workshop the title with them. Came up with vacuuming in the nude. My mom's third <laughs> book will be coming out. <laughs> and so, you know, I dealt with my mom and my dad because uh, I try and keep them close as I can to the business just to keep them engaged. And, right. and so that was great. Then I ran to a recording studio the next morning. Uh, I narrated two episodes of Deadliest Catch which is in season 18. Yeah. And then I walked down the hall and into another studio and I narrated two episodes of Bering Sea Gold, which yeah. is in season 12. Mm -hmm. Then later that afternoon, I went back to the first studio and narrated an episode of How the Universe Works, which is in season 10 on the Science Channel. Then I came home and I came right down here and I sat in this exact chair and I wrote and recorded the raps for a show on Fox business network called how America works. Mm -hmm. And that I'm literally shooting raps on this phone right here. This is the setup. <laughs> Plug awesome. this thing in. Right. This is the microphone. Yeah. This is a prime time. This is the number one prime time show on Fox business network. It's basically dirty jobs without me in it. I right. just produce it, narrate it. And now I present it from this chair. Mm -hmm. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen, Evan. I'm, this is a, that, that's an iPhone 13 yeah. on 4K shooting high def, which looks as good as any field camera I've ever seen. So I'm literally shooting the wraps for a primetime show right here in this, in this chair. Then I immediately turned around, you know, the MicroWorks Foundation is now a barking dog. We're 14 years old. We're giving right. away a million bucks next week and work ethic scholarships. So I sat here and I went through some of those applications. And, um, and that's basically the way it is every 
every week, sprinkle in the occasional thing on a podcast that I that I want to be yeah. on, like yours, and the barking dog that is my own podcast, which I record here as well, or sometimes on the road. And that's kind of what a week looks like. You know, it's always going to be a combination of uh, storytelling, speeches, podcasting, writing, recording, filming, and apologizing. Because <laughs> somewhere along the line, I'm going to piss somebody off. Where, what, do you have, do you have something that you look forward to more than the rest? Like, I know it's hard to distinguish between all of it. But is there something that sticks out where you're like, I really enjoyed this. This is the section that I most look forward to. Because I can imagine, and I'm just going to add to this, which is I can imagine after so many seasons of The Deadliest Catch, and this is just my imagination, you're like, that's on autopilot, dude. Like, you you, you got that. It, it has to get repetitive. So is it, but does it, does it still have and hold the same type of value or does it lose a little bit of its... It's luster that you've had. Yeah. 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 I, Cause I'm just imagining the way that it works for, yeah. for you in that process. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's a really good question, but the answer, I think it, it's, if I were to say to you, what was your favorite part about being a soldier? Yeah. You would, you would probably hitch because you know that the thing you like the most simply can't happen without the stuff that you don't like. Right. The drilling, the training, the physical fitness, the the prep, the all of it, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, for me, you know, it's it's <laughs> I mean, it's very forest uh, forest gumpian. Life mm-hmm. really is a box of chocolates and I I do prefer the uh <clears throat> the the peanut butter thing wrapped in the fudge. I prefer that to the jelly that yeah. nasty thing filled with the jelly stuff. That's but yeah. but you know what? Um, you, there is no suck to embrace without the jelly bonbon. You have to have it in there. And if you're, if, if, if you're really going to look at your career or your company or your life as this box of chocolates, then you, you kind of have to love the fact that you're not always going to get the one that for now anyway, brings you the most pleasure. And that's the real answer. It changes. Like here yesterday, I, I got a keyboard set up over here because I've been writing these crazy jingles to sing during right. the podcast. That doesn't, doesn't really lead directly to money. And the people in my world would look at the hour or two I spent doing that and conclude it was a colossal waste of time. But I, right. but I really enjoyed doing it. And I, and I think it made me better and more interesting in some weirdly indefinable way. So I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to arbitrage the, uh, the, the curds from the way, you know, you don't want to skim the cream off of the thing. The real, the real answer is any of the things I just described would become tire tedious and tiresome if I had to do it the same way day after day after day. But the fact that I'm somehow in, in, in the middle of this hot mess of stuff is really fun. And, you know, it's the real challenge and the real gratifying part is, is being able to take micro works mm-hmm. and, and lay it like a, like a film, like a patina yeah. over everything. And so today I'm, I'm really in a fortunate spot where I can't promote dirty jobs without promoting micro works. And I can't promote micro works without promoting how America works. Right. And I can't promote how America works without giving a shout out to some of the sponsors of that show who also support my foundation. Right. And, and then I get to talk about it in front of an audience, you know, on, on a stage or maybe on Tucker Carlson. Or maybe right. with you on a podcast. Uh, it's just a long way of saying I don't. I don't think you can separate heads from tails and and still have a coin. So when you're when you're working on your your foundation and what's 
what's the mission when you when you when you started it the mission today talk, talk me through that so the foundation started on labor day of 2008 mm -hmm. same day that fred king died the fellow who cured my stutter yeah. my old music teacher um dirty jobs was the number one show on discovery mm -hmm. and we were in 180 countries and i was doing well the country however was sliding into a recession right and um the headlines were constantly filled with unemployment numbers like every day five five and a half six six and a half seven seven it was just all the way up to 11 12 percent mm -hmm. but um on dirty jobs everywhere i went i saw help wanted signs and it became pretty clear that there was another narrative going on in the country that had to do with work and it wasn't it was counter to this idea that we could fix unemployment by creating more opportunity there were two and a half million jobs at the time that were wide open while all these people were unemployed and it just made me think something's something's wrong with the way these jobs are being presented you know you can make six figures welding yeah. you know I've, I've, we've trained over 700 people to do that very thing they're killing it but back then i no one was telling their stories and so i just thought it would be interesting to create a um a platform that would allow me to promote uh the opportunities that had allowed my my show to prosper but that no one was really focusing on and so microwork started as a pr campaign for good jobs that nobody wanted it morphed into a trade resource center so fans of dirty jobs literally built this online resource where you could go and enter your uh, any zip code and immediately look at the opportunities in that zip code that didn't require a four-year degree mm. and that became a really interesting thing to talk about and i was invited to congress a, a number of times to testify about the importance of better pr for all of these jobs that used to follow shop class but of course right. with shop class gone right and um and today it it still is both of those things but mostly it's a uh, it's a scholarship fund i raise a bunch of money and i give it away every year in the form of work ethic scholarships and i do it because now I'm able to circle back to people we helped four or five years ago and uh, and see how they're doing. And those are the stories that are moving the needle. You know, when you I just talked to a guy the other day who um, we gave him like six thousand dollars. He got a welding certificate. Right. And nobody ever tells these stories. But because some people will just go on to weld for the rest of their life. And that's great. Others will get new certifications and they'll wind up underwater welding. Those guys are making 250 grand a year. Right. But lots of other people do what this guy did. He, um, he hired a friend of his and the two of them started a welding business. And then he hired a plumber. And then he got his own certification in uh, HVAC and then electric. And now he's got three vans and 12 people with more work than they can do. They're all working 60, 70 hours a week yeah. in their chosen fields. They, he's got a mechanical contracting company. And it started because he didn't, like me, he didn't want to borrow money to go to college. He was trying to get his toolbox filled out. He was good with his hands. And he had a, uh, he had a natural talent for welding. And now he's got a business. So that's what microworks does. You know, my my job today with the foundation is really just to tap the country on the shoulder and say, "Hey, what about him? What about her? Check out this story." You know, here's how Evan did it. Right? What what can we learn from that? You know, here's how this guy, this girl. And so, you know, the fact that I get to do that on that philanthropic level while delivering TV shows that are very similar in their optics to networks who are happy to pay me for it. That's great. That's, that's my world. You know, it's just like the box of chocolates thing It's I, I don't have clean lines between work and play. 
right. or blue collar and white collar or heads and tails. You know, my, my life is a mix of vocation, avocation, the missionary position and the mercenary position, <laughs> both of which, by the way, I think are uh, underrated. They're underrated. Mm -hmm. Is it, do you think in the last, I would say, the last 20 years that you've been doing this, do you think that you've had a direct impact on uh, the narrative in America towards, we'll, we'll call it the dirty jobs? And I, I mean, I think that's a, it's a loaded question because I think that you have, but. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's worse than loaded. I mean, if I answer honestly, I'm going to sound like a douche because the truth is, yeah, I think I have, yeah. you know, and I don't want to throw my arm out of socket, pat myself on the back, but it, 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 it's a very, very slow incremental thing. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, people find, <laughs> look, I, I, I guess the truth is I would love to be able to look at micro works and say, this, this is the thing that did it, but it, but it's not, it's, it's all of it. You, you, you can't, what do they say about advertising? Only 10% of it works, but you'll never know which 10%, right? Right. I mean, yeah. you, I, you must see yourself as, as a marketer, you know, you have to, you're running a company, yeah. but you know, everything, not everything you do is going to work. Most of the things you do aren't going to work. Right. Um, and, and finding the thing that does, that's the, that's the trick. And the, the trick of my career and, and the truth of my life has been dirty jobs has been the thing that has done more to stimulate meaningful conversations about the definition of a good job. It's done more to open the eyes of a lot of people who might otherwise look askance at these opportunities, but it did so in a way that was completely non-earnest. I mean, no company would look at dirty jobs and say, that's how I want to market my industry. Right. But the truth is, any company today who's ever been featured on that show, if they were given a chance to go back in time and own it outright, pay for the whole thing, lock, yeah. lock stock and barrel, right. they would all do it. And, and so the, the moral of that story is, you know, it's, it's really tempting. And this is what we, I think we started talking about, the temptation to look back and say, let me tell you how I did it. Let me right. tell you how it happened. That, um, that, that just doesn't work. You know, this, this, this happened because my mother called me when I was working for CBS uh, in 2001, right across the bay here in San Francisco, hosting a show called Evening Magazine. She called me on the phone and she said, Michael, your grandfather just turned 90. He's not going to be around forever. Wouldn't it be great, she said, her exact words, wouldn't it be great if before he died, he could turn on the television and see you doing something that looked like work? <laughs> <laughs> That's how it happened. Like, so here I am you know, growing up in the shadow of my pop, knowing that the thing I want to do, I'm not equipped to do, taking his advice getting a new toolbox, getting in this crazy career, doing everything from home shopping shows in the middle of the night to infomercials to singing in the opera, all that for, for 22 years, I do that. And then my mom calls me to tell me that my pop <laughs> isn't going to be around forever. I take a cameraman the next day into the sewers of San Francisco. And what we filmed down there, as I attempted to host an episode of Evening Magazine from the sewer, mm -hmm is the final chapter of my book and the reason Dirty Jobs got on the air. That was the footage that started the whole thing. And so, you know, to try and redact all this or to try and retrofit it and, and, and tell you that any of it was the result of a neatly ordered life or a well-laid plan, it was a phone call from my mom and uh, that came at a time when I, when I wanted to do a show that I actually cared about, I didn't care about anything I had done in the entertainment industry. It was all crap. You know, I was good at it, but it was crap. 
it wasn't until I it wasn't until I got in real crap that did (laughs) did you shop it did you did you did you bundle it and shop it or was it how did that work and that do were you like this is my idea I'm gonna take it out and did you pitch it to other you know you pitch them to other networks I'm assuming right or do you take it straight to everybody I took it to everybody what happened was what happened in the sewer was so mind bogglingly disgusting and funny and yeah. smart. I, I failed at hosting the episode, but I ran into a guy named Gene Cruz down there who was a sewer inspector. And because I couldn't do any of the things I thought I was going to be able to do, I just worked as his apprentice, right? Re- replacing bricks in the wall that had succumbed to the second law of thermodynamics. Right. Right. And the conversation I had with Gene and the work and the roaches and the rats and all of the shit. And I mean, you're literally squatting in a river of shit. Condoms, yeah. condoms are sticking <laughs> to your rubber boots and you're hammering away. This goes on the air uh, at seven o'clock at night, it, you know, in, in San Francisco. People are sitting down in Marin ready to watch their beloved evening magazine show and right. hear stories about three-legged dogs who had overcome canine kidney failure, right? And what they see is me crawling through this crap river covered with condoms replacing bricks. It was, <laughs> so I was fired from evening magazine, uh, but they let me keep the footage. I took that footage, I put it together with some other stuff that I thought would be good. Uh, it wasn't funny enough for Comedy Central. It was too funny for um, PBS. It yeah. was not gross enough for Fox. It was too gross for C. I mean, it, it, I took it everywhere. Yeah. And even Discovery, when they looked at it, they were like, ah, it's a talk show in a sewer. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. But, yeah. you know, but it's also a talk show on a crab boat and a bridge and an opal mine. And an anthracite mine. And, you know, and they were like, well, we'll try maybe three episodes of it. So they ordered a mini series. It was like three episodes yeah. of this thing called Dirty Jobs. And um, look, man, the truth is this, is, this is a crazy story. It went on the air in 2003 and it raided through the roof. But it, it was not the show that, Discovery wanted its viewers to love. <laughs> what what was the show that they wanted? Do you do you remember what was, was the type of show that they wanted to love? They just didn't Jacques like Cousteau, it. Jacques Cousteau, David oh, Attenborough, yeah. Planet oh, Earth, gotcha. yeah, right? They sense. were yeah, gotcha. They were in the business of satisfying gotcha. curiosity mm-hmm. with the most beautiful footage they could find, right. with the most experienced documentary filmmakers they could hire. And with credible insiders, their whole their whole business model back then was, you know, h- hire real scientists and real archaeologists, and let's get these experts on camera saying and doing expert things as hosts. And that that's what the model was. Dirty Jobs didn't have a host; it had a guest. You know, I was the apprentice. The host yeah. was a guy in a sewer who you'd never heard of doing a job right. you didn't know existed. That this was not what they wanted people to love, but they put it on and people loved it. So the question became what what to do with this? And while basically they put it on the shelf and said to me, look, let's let's just go another way. They they sent me to Egypt, they sent me all through Africa, they sent me through South America. I was supposed to go to the Titanic with James Cameron, climb wow. Kilimanjaro, go on all yeah. these adventures. All was great. And we started doing all that stuff. Dirty jobs still on the shelf. And then they saw some footage of a crab boat in real trouble up off the Pribilof Islands in the Bering Sea. And they said, what do you think of that? I'm like, well, that looks like something. I don't know what it is. So they sent me up to Dutch Harbor to figure out what this thing called deadliest season was. Okay, Didn't know if it was a documentary maybe a movie, maybe a, a TV show. We, we didn't know. And um, I went up there and uh, yeah, I went to six funerals in six weeks. Um, 
it was a world unlike anything I had seen. I hosted the first season, Evan. I actually was on a boat called the Bountiful hosting it, like right. part Stone Phillips, part yeah. Greenhorn. I and and then boats started sinking and people started dying. And and it like the stakes were just incredible. And the work was like, man. And so the biggest difference between Deadliest Catch and Dirty Jobs for me at, at that point <laughs> was that one had the potential to be very funny and very personal. And the yeah. other had the potential to be uh, a horror movie uh, and also compelling. And when the network saw the footage that we came back with from Dutch, that's actually what made him go, all right, well, we want to do this. We, we want to figure out whatever this is. And then in the meantime, and you can't script this, but they were going through this whole process of trying to figure out what the next generation of discovery would look like. So they were, they were focus grouping people like Bear Grylls and the Mythbusters and Steve Irwin. And they yeah. sent all these shows and all this tape down to Vegas. And they had a big focus group. Well, somebody at the network, I don't know who, but somebody took a couple of the episodes of Dirty Jobs that had aired earlier that year that were deemed too off-brand to even put back on the air. They, they put it into the, the test group as fodder, just something to go in between the videos of the shows right. and the talent that they really wanted to test. Well, you can guess what happened. The audience went bananas. They were like, Dirty Jobs is the show we want to watch. It, it, it beat all the others. And they said, <laughs> and that guy, you know, he's way less annoying <laughs> than, <laughs> than a typical host. So I wound up testing really, really well in a focus group that I wasn't supposed to be in. And Dirty Jobs tested through the roof uh, in that same group. So two things happened. They looked at Deadliest Catch and realized that there was something there. And I think they looked at me and Dirty Jobs and said, maybe it's more than a talk show in a sewer. So they gave me basically a choice. They're like, you can host whichever one you want. And I said, well, when in doubt, take the one with your name in the title, the one <laughs> dedicated to your granddad. Um, and I stayed on to narrate Deadliest Catch. They cut me out of the first season. All that footage went on the cutting room floor and I became a narrator instead of a host, which in hindsight was the luckiest thing that ever happened. I, uh, I'm, I'm interested to know, so you've got all of these things going in parallel. You're narrating, you're hosting, you've got your foundation. What do you, what do, you do outside? Is there, is there no delineation between what you do for work and what you do for recreation? Are you all work? Are you just having so much fun during work that you, there's, there's no outside? Or yeah. what is it you're doing outside of work? That there, there, there is no, there is no work. There is no play. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's, it's so weird, man, because there was a time in my life when those two things were so clearly delineated right before the phone call from my mom, you know, I touched everything like it was hot. I had my toolbox put together. I could freelance whenever I wanted right? I, I, I took four or five months off every year, traveled, mm -hmm. you know, I, it, that was my life. Super, super, super clear. And now there's no, no, there, there, there's no line at all. There's a great poem by Robert Frost called, uh, two tramps in mud time. <laughs> and, uh, there's a, there's a line in it. I, I'll, I'll get it wrong, but it speaks exactly to what you're talking about. The poem is great. He's, he, the narrator, Frost, is, is splitting wood in his backyard. And these two lumberjacks come out of the trees. And, um, you know, it looks like they haven't eaten in a while. They're filthy. And uh, they stop and they watch him splitting wood. And the whole poem is a rumination on what happens when the, the lumberjacks say, hey, we could, we could do that for you. It's what we do. You right. know, it's our vocation. And maybe you could give us a meal or a couple of bucks or something. But meanwhile, Frost is like, this is a problem because 
I'm not a lumberjack, but I love to split wood. There's nothing I love more than the business of putting a piece of oak on top of a locust block and hitting it just right. And this poem goes into all these descriptions of the joy he feels at pursuing his avocation while these two guys who are depending on the work for a living are standing there waiting for a chance to to work for their food. And so the whole thing is this morality play. It's this it's this nightmare where he has to decide which is more important, you know, love or need. His his love of doing his hobby or their need for work. And he says something along the lines of uh, my goal in life is to see all things with one eye in sight, uh, make my avocation my vocation, where, where, where love and need are one and work is play for mortal stakes. Only then can the deed be done for heaven and for future sake. So it's a very long answer to your question, but that's the the moment that Frost wrote about a hundred years ago is the thing I think I far scumped my, my way into where my avocation and my vocation actually really did become the same thing where love and need are one and work is play for mortal stakes. A bit like being a soldier, no? Yeah. Very, very, very similar. I think that that's, I'm going to have to look that up because I, I've, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, truly in its essence, I think I've, I've always thought about this because there are things that I've, we enjoy just as, you know, adults. And, you know, I, I like to fly fish, right. And I like to go out and row rivers and fly fish. And I like to be outside. It's fun, but it's not we're running the business or, you know, getting able to like, like dig in and solve a problem. It's not, it's not, it's not even close to as fun as this because catching a fish is not the same as solving a business problem. And then if it's not a business problem, well, you know, I have, I have two little kids. I got a four-year-old and eight-year-old and like that's outside of work. That's like the single best thing in my life. Right. That's like, sure that the one thing that you're, you're driving towards all the time. But I think about that from the people that I talk to. The other thing I ask, I like to ask is like, do you believe this is, this is a, it's not a complex question. Do you believe in retirement? Like, do you believe in this whole concept of like retiring and like going to like Boca and playing golf or whatever that is? Or... <laughs> no, I yeah. used to. Yeah. Look, okay. I mean, I, I was, and still am, to be honest, really enamored of the uh, the business model mm-hmm. of my favorite fictitious character, who is uh, Travis McGee, made famous in 24 Mysteries by a guy named John D. McDonald. Mm-hmm. And McGee, he, uh, he lived on a houseboat, basically solved crimes, helped people recover things that were swindled from them or stolen right. from them. So had part private eye, part ne'er do well, part you know Don Quixote. Um, but McGee said that he preferred to take his retirement in early installments, <laughs> and I loved that. You know, yeah. I love the idea of you know you come out of the cave, you eat what you kill, you make little rocks out of big rocks, you do whatever you do for money, yeah. and then you take a chunk of your retirement because. It's promised to no one, right? Right. And why, yeah. why wait? <laughs> why wait yeah. to start having fun? You know, like you only get one one bite at the apple. Yeah. So, so I I do like the idea of you know what gather ye rosebuds while ye may. You know, you have yeah. fun. Like the dirty jobs is is brutal. They're 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 days that are insanely difficult, and and you wouldn't want to do again. Even the time, you know, with the shark, when I was yeah. literally scared out of my mind. You know what we did that evening? We went out. We made some new friends, me and the crew. Jeremiah introduced me to some of his friends. We tied one on, and we and we had a party for the ages. And I wouldn't trade that evening for anything. But that evening doesn't exist without 
Leon dragging my airless body up to the surface. Right. So it's, it's just all connected. So you're, you know, your question is good, but it's, it's tricky because it, it kind of forces me to draw that line again between work and play, love and need, vocation, avocation. You got to raise those two kids of yours while you're tending to a thousand employees, building a brand, making marketing decisions. You know, it's, it, you just don't get to separate it. And, and I, you know, the more we talk about it, the more I realize it's, we're kind of told from the jump that we need to separate it. Yeah. Nine to five, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You you have to be one person at Mm -hmm. nine to five and then somebody else when you get home. Mm -hmm. Why, why would you, where, where does it say that? Why not take your retirement in installments? I think maybe what will happen is that, you know, things will just rebalance. It'll be a little less of this, a little more of that. Maybe. I don't, I don't think I can do dirty jobs much longer, to be honest. Uh, but I could do How America Works forever. Right. Uh, I can do a podcast for as long as I can talk. And right. so it's just uh, everything in degrees, right? So you've seen a ton of uh, this beautiful country of ours outside of your home. Tell me some of the most underrated places you've been able to visit that I think you would have unique insight into that other people just don't. Yeah. You know, I get that question a lot and I really, yeah. um, Well, along with like, you know, what was your dirtiest job? Oh, right. Right. And it's not a bad question. But it's like, the real truth is dirty jobs wasn't about dirt or jobs. It was about people. Right. And the thing about geography is not so different. Yeah. You know, I've been to some of the most forgettable places in the country and had the best time of my life. And so I don't, I don't know what to tell you about Hobbs, New Mexico. Geographically, it ain't much. It's flat. They don't have any really great restaurants. There's there's a lot about it that would inspire the average person to keep driving. I love it. I had a great time there. And 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 I can only conclude it's because of reasons that aren't geographic. <laughs> right. Uh, looking out my window right now, there's the there's the San Francisco Bay. It's a deep like royal blue today and there's yeah. the bridge which is this bright, vibrant orange. And there's the Marin headlands. It looks like Ireland. It's green. You know, it's just, it's, it's beautiful. This place is so screwed up, Evan. (laughs) It's, it's just mind bogglingly insane what the leaders here are doing to this gem. And so it's like that old, Crowded house song, four seasons in one day. <laughs> uh, yeah. It doesn't pay to make predictions, sleeping in an unmade bed, finding out wherever there is comfort, there is pain. Only one step away, four seasons in one day. Geography is a trick. Yeah. Um, jobs are a trap because jobs, there's no such thing as job satisfaction. If there were, every every stockbroker would be satisfied. Every garbage man would be miserable. Mm. But of course it's, it's job satisfaction has almost nothing to do with jobs and your happiness has almost nothing to do with your geography. And I, I would have given you a different answer, maybe even a better one a few years ago, but you're right. I've I've been to every state a dozen times and I've worked in, I think every industry and I met a lot of different people in a lot of different places. And um, they, 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 they smear together into an amalgam. And uh, it's hard for me, for whatever reason, to, uh, to talk about geography. Isn't that weird, man? I don't know why. But you know what? Maybe since you're a fly fisherman, you ever read uh, A River Runs Through It? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Google those last couple lines if you want 
real, real beauty, real, real goosebumps where he talks about the big fort coming together and the water running over the rocks. Right. And, yeah. and filing away the ravages of time, you know, and a river runs through it. It's there are no lines. There are no real clear delineations. No. It, so are you a, are you a Harrison fan? Have you read his other, his other books? Do you, you know what? Cause he did, he did the, he did a bunch of uh, UP stuff. I remember. Yeah. And, and I'm trying to think he had like Brown dog and mm-hmm. um, uh, legends of the fall, I think was based on a book that he did. He was a great author. I, oh, he, he's, I think he's still around. He's a, He's, he wrote a cookbook. The guy's incredible. Yeah. Like, yeah. He's a, he's a hoot. Like if you, if you watched anything from that guy, like he, he reminds me of if we would have had significant footage of Hemingway is the way that he would talk or interact. Cause he seems like he's, 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 he's ringing the sponge on life. Like he's eating everything. He's smoking, he's drinking, he's doing, <laughs> right. he's doing it all. Like he's going to yeah. fill himself up. Yeah. I'll take a I'll take a deeper dive. I should know more about him. I don't. He's but, an um, interesting guy. But the question I had was leading from authors, which what what was the last thing you read that you really enjoyed? Fiction. Oh. Well, I've already mentioned it. In fact, I'm I'm rereading. Here, I'll show you one. Okay. I got them all over the place here. Hang on a second. This is uh all of the uh all the titles in in this Travis McGee series have a oh nice have a color in them, right? So it could yeah. be like like the uh, the turquoise lament, yeah. the long lavender look. You've got <laughs> yeah. a deadly shade of gold, bright orange for the shroud, uh, the lonely silver rain, the deep blue goodbye, cinnamon skin. It's a, it's Pulp Fiction, yeah, but it it has such a great central character that recurs that you kind of fall in love with the guy. You, you fall in love with Travis McGee and then you fall in love with the fact that he lives on a houseboat. Right. And then you just go on these adventures with him. And it, it, it's such, it's such good pulp fiction that uh, I, I reread them every five or six years mm-hmm. and I'm just, and I'm just doing it again to remind myself that, and by the way, it's it's not just me. If you read the um, you read the blurbs inside and on the back, I mean, let's okay. The the undisputed great entertainer of our age and a mesmerizing storyteller. That's Stephen King saying this. <laughs> really? That's Stephen King. You got <laughs> right. Donald Westlake, uh, one of my idols, Jonathan Kellerman. The undisputed Whoa. consummate pro, a master storyteller and witty observer. Dean Kuntz says, quote, my favorite novelist of all no time, hands way. down. It just goes on and on and on, right? And so, you know, when I stumbled across these things, I felt like I had found um, a treasure. Yeah. In, you know, and and then it was like this best kept secret. You know, the whole Jack Reacher phenomenon oh, yeah. right yeah. now? Yeah. So Jack Reacher, that's all Lee Child. Lee mm-hmm. Child, who I, I hope to have as a guest sometime on, on my podcast, credits his entire career. Every, he was an advertising guy in Britain who quit his job when he was in his 40s, late 40s, and started writing Jack Reacher. The entire thing is based on John D. McDonald and Travis McGee, all of it. And he explains exactly why that prototype became his inspiration for everything. Like Lee Child and I are living the same basic life, except he's a writer and I'm doing whatever I'm doing. Yeah. But but whittle it all back down, you know. I mean, it's, it's interesting, this conversation we're having, because I, I told you about the people who had the greatest influence on me. My grandfather, my mom, my scoutmaster, my high school teacher, and of course, everybody I've ever met on Dirty Jobs. But if, if had you asked me the greatest impact of a fictitious character, 
I, that's Travis McGee to the yeah. point where my entire business model was based on his. So crazy when you think about the things that ultimately inform you, you know, and the idea that somehow uh, fiction would be subordinate to nonfiction. Again, yeah. there is no line, mm. you know, there's no, no line. I, at all. I never, so I wouldn't read fiction. So for a long time, I would never, I wouldn't read fiction because I found it, it is a ridiculous young man's uh, fiction that they tell themselves where they're like, well, this is a waste of time, right? It's a waste of time. I've got to read nonfiction. I've got to read history. Um, and so recently I've come back to it. It's because one of my friends, um, he's a former Navy SEAL. He's, he's been, he's, he brought me back to fiction in my adult life. So he's Jack Carr writes these books, uh, Terminal List and some of these other books that he's, he's put out. They're incredible. So Amazon just finished the Terminal List for him. And they're, they're really good. He, just, he retired a few years ago as a Navy SEAL. Now he's a, a, a no shit, great author. And, um, but that's led me to come back to revisiting because I, when I was younger, I would read a lot of fiction specifically, mm -hmm. and then I turned it all off and then went into more uh, specifically like tactics and history and things that were a little bit deeper and not deeper, but different in nature. So the thing that I'm reading now, which uh, is funny because I came back to it, it's Louis L'Amour, everything that he's written yep. because he's, he's such an important part of my family's history. Every house I was, I was in as a kid, every yep. house I was in had Louis L'Amour books, every one of them. Yep. And I started thinking about that just like a, a month ago, probably. I was like, you yep. know what? I never gave him a chance. And for whatever reason, when I was a kid, I was on to other things, you know, Jack London or whatever it was. And, and now I'm like, I turn it back and he's a great author. He really is. And of for course. what it is, it's amazing. <laughs> he, he got so big that it became hip not to read him. He got too yeah. big. But, yeah. but it's so, look, it, it, it all, it's a wheel. It's the wheel of Fortuna. And it all comes around. You know, there's no such thing as an old joke if you're hearing right. it for the first time. And those Louis L'Amour books are, are, are treasure troves. They're classics. You know, they're very different than the McDonald books, but they're very similar in the fact that once, once you understand where he's coming from right. and the kinds of stories he's telling, it's comfort food. It, it is. They're very, very comfortable to read. And they're always well-written and surprising. And again, you know, the stuff you can learn from fiction is no less important or voluminous than what you can learn from reading a <laughs> Any nonfiction book, as far as I'm You're concerned. absolutely correct. I find myself thinking more, I would say, from an introspective, philosophical point of view when I'm reading, de depending on the fiction. When I'm reading fiction than I do when I'm reading, you know, nonfiction. Obviously, there's there's a wide breadth, but you you're you're correct. You if there is no d distinguishing line between the two. And you're just pulling information and, and truly you're just enjoying the, the immersion of the experience. That's what it's about. It's not about, from my perspective now, as, as, a, you know, as I get older, it's a lot like what you were saying with geography. If we're enjoying the experience, it's irrelevant to the terrain. <laughs> and I, it's, it's, I, love, I, I love those two cities. I've said this a hundred, if not a thousand times. San Francisco is, I think, one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful city in the United States. Yep. As far as weather, as far as uh, access to the outdoors, is, I, I, I love everything about it. To include if we went all the way up the coast of Seattle, I despise the politics <laughs> of, sure. of the individual cities. I lived in Seattle for seven years and uh, off and on for multiple years. And I loved the city. I grew up kind of there going back and forth from the inland Northwest. Like I love it. 
And now when you go, it's like, ah, just not yeah. the same. No. I'm not, not the same. Um, I made a joke to a buddy of mine in town about five years ago when things really started to circle the drain. And I said, you know, somebody ought to come up with the crap app. You know, there's so much shit yeah. in the streets. It would be convenient to know. He did it. He created this. That, that was he, he did that off the head conversation. It. You can download the crap app today yeah. and you can look at San Francisco and see where the real preponderance of feces is. <laughs> and I mean, what, <laughs> what, what, what else do you need to know? I mean, it's like, yeah. this is, this is where we are. You know, Silicon Valley is a very, very, very smart, very capable of pivoting quickly to the needs yeah. of whatever. Yeah. Well, right now we, we need to know where the crap is because, right. you know, we're here on vacation with our kids and we'd like to step over as little of it as possible. So where should we avoid answer? M most of downtown. Most of downtown. Several. So one, one final thought or question, which is a piece of poetry that, stands out as, as the most prominent that resonates in your mind over and over uh, that you can think of? Look, I, I'm a sucker for, well, <laughs> Yates has a lot of good ones, man. I was sexing chickens once at a place called Murray McMurtry. You Everybody take, does that. We were all sexing chickens at a place... It's a time. hell of a thing, dude. You, you, I mean, you, you take these little things, you got to, you got to peer in their assholes. Right. And if they're cockerels, they got the little tiny bump. And if they're not, they're, they're, they're uh, pullets. Cockerels go over here. Pullets go over there. Cockerels get ground up at the end of the day. So it's important to get it right. But you know, you gotta, you gotta squeeze them. You gotta squeeze the crap out of them. And then you look in their little tiny holes. And I remember doing this with this Asian dude who was about 90 years old. And while I was doing it, I thought of this poem called uh, Crazy Jane Talks to the Bishop by William Butler Yeats. And one of the, <laughs> you, got, you got to imagine, right? I'm on international TV. I'm squeezing the poop out of chickens and I'm looking in their assholes as I say, a woman can be proud and stiff when on love intent, but love has pitched his mansion in the place of excrement. <laughs> For nothing can be whole or soul that has not been rent. So, you know, you got dander and shit flying through the air. <laughs> Me standing next to this ancient Asian man quoting Yates. And that, you know, there was a certain symmetry to that, but that's a, that's a TV answer. Like in real yeah. life, it's back to frost. And it's yeah. probably the road not taken. Cause that's, Right. I mean, I, I've just never come across a poem that was more universally relevant to more people um, and also more personally relevant to me. Do you know it? Not from heart. Yeah. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. Sorry I couldn't travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood, looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, but having perhaps a better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. But as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay. Two fields no step had trodden black. I kept the first for another day, but knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I would ever go back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by. And that's made all the difference. Mike Rowe, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for spending a couple of hours with me today. Yeah, man. Um, I, uh, I would love to be able to do this again someday. Well, look, one good turn deserves another. When yeah. things settle down a bit, hop on my deal. I'd we'll talk for to. another two hours and I'll crawl inside your head. That'd be great. I, uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed this. Two hours is not enough. Um, but I, I, 
absolutely love the love the time that we've been able to spend together. Um, I'll send this out to everyone that's listening today. I'm going to post some links. I've taken notes to make Uh-oh. sure that we capture this uh, in the context of if we need to link uh, poems, authors, events, episodes. We'll do that for everybody. So look for it in the YouTube uh, description. Mike, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, man, thanks. And when I say thanks for your service, I don't just mean the military. I mean, for building a company, for employing vets. You're doing a hell of a thing up there, man. I'm a huge fan. And I'm going to go have my fourth cup of (laughs) AK-47 today and hope the O-ring holds. Oh, yeah. Selena. We forgot to talk about Selena, too. She is a national treasure. Our... uh, Oh, Our mutual you know. friend. Yes. Yeah. 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 She is. She's, is she? T- I mean, she is amazing. She's amazing. Yeah. She's amazing. I love that woman. Talk I, about uh, geography. That girl, she knows what she's. I mean, she does not write about a place until she goes there. Yeah. So, I love it. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. All right. Talk soon. Yeah. Adios. Yeah.